And on behalf of the uh, Scapins International Society and the Retina Research Foundation, we have a little something to help you through the sabbatical on to the next great idea. Thank you, David. Well, thank you very much, David. That was overly kind and generous, and I really appreciate it. And fortunately, you've already, uh, you've already listed all my conflicts, so I don't have to do that anymore. Uh, but, uh, but I'm very pleased to be here, um, and I want to thank all of you for coming and uh, being gracious enough to hear what I have to say. I want you to know that I'm actually using a digital tool, an iPad, for my notes rather than something I'm pulling out of my pocket. But uh, it's, a, it's a great honor to be here. This is, you see this picture of Charles Scapins, and he was really one of the most acknowledged and celebrated pioneers of retinal surgery in the 20th century. He, been, he invented the binocular indirect ophthalmoscope. He described the technique of encircling buckling and many of the normal and abnormal features of the peripheral retina enabled by that invention and his keen observational powers. In his native French, he would be called formidable, in our, in, our, in our current uh, lexicon, he probably would be called a KOL, a key opinion leader. But his words and even his facial gestures could evoke either pleasure or abject horror uh, in, the, in the face of all of us that uh, knew him as really one of the grand old men of uh, ophthalmology uh, through his force of intellect and his intelligence and his drive and his ambition. Uh, I remember the day I met him, I was a first-year faculty member at Bascom Palmer at Arvo, and I was talking about 5FU and PBR, and he was the moderator, and I was shaking in my boots. And when I finished, he said, nice job, but um, we already have a word for injections into the eye. It, it, it's vitreous. It's both a noun and an adjective. We don't need a new word like intravitreal. I'll actually rest my case, but he was right in many ways, as always. And I do want to give a shout out to Alice McPherson, who's here in the front row today. She's been a magnanimous and magnificent uh, leader uh, in our community. She's enabled this gift and so many other gifts uh, and, and uh, lectures. And I think it really speaks to the idea of giving back. And I do want to congratulate you and thank you, Alice, for all that you do for our profession. Now, I'll, I will actually show you my, uh, count, my disclosures potential conflicts, such as they are. But I'll tell you a little bit about what I believe to be the way we're headed and maybe the future as I see it. Um, and that is uh, the convergence of our aging population and the new digital age uh, have the capacity really to transform the way that we practice medicine, practice ophthalmology, including the site of service, the cost, and the quality of care. In the next few minutes, I'll share my thinking about that with you. This is going to mean major changes for ophthalmology, I think, as we progress, and I think there'll be good changes with both associated opportunities and perhaps some challenges. Patient demographics are one, and in conjunction with this, we're seeing increasing problems with affordability of care and a move towards value-based models, the adoption of electronic records, this revolution in consumer electronics and telecommunications has really changed the way we all live and work. By the year 2020, just 15 years, 2030, excuse me, 15 years from now, it's been estimated that there are going to be 72 million Americans aged 65 or older. Taking care of these patients is going to represent a considerable challenge to a system that's already very stressed due to the fact that the global population aged 65 and greater is growing more rapidly than the population of ophthalmologists. Additionally, the U.S. health care costs are nearly $3 trillion. Think of that, $3 trillion annually, or 17% of our gross domestic product, and they're trending upwards towards 20% unless things change. As retinal surgeons, we know this firsthand because just simply the spending on anti-VEGF agents alone represents one of the most uh, common and expensive line item on the CMS budget, and it continues to accelerate, but with good reason, we're helping patients. In addition to biologics and other therapeutics, diagnostics have also markedly improved and become increasingly expensive in that process. From the introduction of the original retinal camera in 1925, imagine this, the average cost of $768. 
to the introduction of the digital fundus camera more recently, costs have increased nearly 40-fold in nominal dollars, and even adjusting for inflation, more than tenfold as seen in this slide. Fortunately, innovation continues at a breathtaking pace, which gives us all great hope for the future in terms of bringing new methods of diagnosis and therapeutics to bear for our patients and for their benefit. And yet, these innovations are also accompanied by acceleration in prices. Much of the office instrumentation that we buy today is in excess of forty or fifty thousand dollars and up to $150,000, and this includes things that I've helped to work on, like smart lasers. So these are costs that we're bearing, and they may be, you know, in many ways, too much to bear in the future. In addition to the increased cost of care, there have been accompanying payer trends. Payers are not standing still. They're changing the way they do things, and this includes a movement to accountable care and quality measures as a means of containing or reducing costs. As you can see here, accountable measures to uh, essentially uh, modify the stages for payment are, are coming, and they're going to be here soon, and, and in fact, they're already here. Regulatory trends are another thing that are driving this movement towards a new digital practice, if you will. Um, this includes the High Tech Act, which really created the foundational infrastructure for the electronic health record revolution in the United States since its passage in the year 2009. And the rate of adoption has been increasing markedly, and we're now approaching between 87 and, and uh, 94 percent penetration for practices and for hospital systems. Now, on the positive side, there are good things happening, and there are tailwinds, not headwinds, that are enabling physicians and healthcare systems to develop cost effective solutions. To the due to the availability of new technology, which is emerging on the digital front. Smartphones and related mobile devices like iPads and Kindles have changed the way we read, the way we exchange information in the 21st century. If you look at the numbers, it's kind of staggering. In the third quarter of 2015 alone, there were nearly 11 million iPads and 47 and a half million iPhones sold. I don't own any Apple shares. Um, and this represents only a small fraction of the total number of smartphones sold because the larger market is actually based on the Android side. Industry analysts predict that there will be more than two million smartphones in use globally one year from now. It's an absolutely astounding number. This is not just young high school and college students who text and engage in all sorts of social media activities appropriate and otherwise if you're reading the New York Times these days, but also middle-aged and older Americans. As you can see from this graphic here, it's estimated that the number of Americans 65 years of age and greater using smartphones will more than double over a period of five years, reaching nearly 70 percent, excuse me, 30 percent of that demographic just in the coming year. It's no wonder this adoption has taken place if you just stop for a moment and think about why are people buying all this stuff. If we look at the capabilities of smartphones today compared with the most advanced personal computers of 1984 when Macintosh was introduced, it's apparent that these phones are orders of magnitude greater in their computing power and other functionality than these past systems that we thought were so wonderful when we got them. They, there's more than an 80-fold increase in camera pixel density a 200-fold increase in the speed of processing, a 64,000-fold increase in storage capability, despite the fact that the smartphones are less than 1 20th the size and weight of the original relatively small footprint in revolutionary desktop Mac. These smartphones and other devices are now capable of performing a wide variety of diagnostic and, in some instances, therapeutic tests and functions across the entire spectrum of healthcare including multiple specialties, ENT, pulmonary medicine, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and oncology are just several different examples here. The FDA is carefully watching over this and has cleared many mobile units and apps for medical use with rapid acceleration just in the last two or three years, including more than 40 last year alone. Regulations continue to evolve, and the FDA, I think, has shown a remarkable degree of flexibility in adapting rapidly to this important development. As a result, many companies, both ex existing industry leaders with long uh, storied traditions, as well as uh, new companies started up just to take advantage of the mobile revolution, are coming into the space and working on solutions. 
There are now more than six different portable ophthalmic photography systems available that take advantage of the combination of the embedded optics and computing power of phones along with various adapters, and we saw some earlier this morning, and they address a variety of different conditions ranging all the way from amblyopia in young children to age-related macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy. Aside from the ability to capture a fundus image, one of the most powerful features of these devices is their connectivity. From the time of the first office-based digital cameras introduced back in 1995 to now, the combination of an off-the-shelf iPhone and a specialized adapter and some software that cost very little uh, results in a reduction in the cost and form factor of greater than 95% compared with a comparably equipped fixed camera. To boot, some might argue that the performance has also improved, including a tenfold increase in storage, all the, way, all the while enabling a 60-fold decline in cost. Some might reasonably argue that larger cameras probably still have an edge in terms of the quality of raw optical resolution, but with the advent of post-acquisition image processing, uh, many of these pictures are really almost indistinguishable uh, with a little practice. One of the other powerful features of the smartphones enabled with various specialized types of apps and capability, including photography, is that by combining them with other features, um, such as visual acuity testing or note preparation or measurement of refractive error, the many, many uh, apps that are now available, it's possible to provide for multimodality testing of patients in a variety of different settings, ranging all the way from underserved populations in the most remote fringes of the planet to concierge visits in luxury penthouses for patients who are unable or unwilling to come to a physician's office. The same opportunity exists in primary care and urgent care sites in both high and low acuity settings, primarily enabled really by the rapid telecommunications and the lowered cost of transmission of data. The trend for improvement in the quality of smartphones has continued unabated, and I just show you an example of fundus images on the right side from a, from a smartphone or on the left side from a non-midriatic fixed camera used to do a study evaluating the ability to detect diabetic retinopathy and comparing it not to the gold standard even of a, a direct examination, but another camera that was performed at Stanford earlier this year. This is a photograph of a smartphone-based ocular system being used by a visiting physician in Nepal as part of the Himalayan cataract project, demonstrating both the ease of use and the quality of images both the front and back of the eye that are able to be obtained not only in the posterior segment but the anterior segment as well with specialized adapters and it enables them to screen patients in underserved regions at very low or essentially no cost. One of the features that's made this type of connectivity uh, possible is the advent of cloud-based storage and the immediate data transmission. Now of course this does require HIPAA compliant protocols, encryption and other security measures, but these have all been well worked out for the banking industry and other industries where privacy is really important. Using this ecosystem of cloud-based architecture, for the first time tests can be efficiently and reliably decentralized, yet linked together to all members of the healthcare team for a variety of diseases and for a variety of indications such as home visits and work in retail settings. Even conservative estimates um, est suggest that by 2018, three years from now, there will be over 15 million connected home monitoring devices in regular use, radically transforming our landscape. Should be understood that these applications are not just limited to the field of smart appliances for monitoring outside the home, but also in the office or workplace to reduce the cost and improve compliance one can see a variety of different systems. This is one for vision measurement um, compared with a prior digital method. And another one looking at an aberometer and a refractometer by a number of other new startups from Boston and Barcelona and everywhere else that provide some up to a uh, 20x reduction in the cost with very little trade-off in terms of quality. The um, 
Home monitoring, which is rapidly emerging in many other fields of medicine in addition to ophthalmology, is felt to be one of the great areas of growth in terms of improving health care and also reduced cost. Notalst uh, has performed very important and exciting studies demonstrating that home monitoring in patients at high risk can produce earlier detection and potentially better outcomes. And this has put this on the map, and they deserve a lot of credit for that. In the future, a number of innovations are already on the horizon and soon likely to be introduced. These cutting-edge smart devices have the potential to further disrupt the current standard of practice of ophthalmology in just a few years, including retinal diseases, and they include devices to measure intraocular pressure at home, software to be able to enable treatment algorithms, as, as well as screening of patients functionally with a variety of retinal conditions. Recent headlines trumpeted the collaboration of two giants, Google and Alcon, in, in their respective fields who are now collaborating on a novel contact lens-based technology to enable patients to have measurements of their intraocular pressure and possibly glucose. Other key applications under development include smartphone-based visual field testing software used on enabled headsets, such as those that are used for virtual reality and gaming by our kids and other home consumer products. Uh, these may have dedicated near-field displays or, in a in particularly interesting uh, and novel contribution, they can use a smartphone that can be introduced into a otherwise non-high-tech um, headpiece that can be made out of cardboard and the iPhone or a, or a, a smartphone uh, can be used as the near-field device to be able to look at stereo images uh, and to do a number of other things, including visual field testing, as shown here in some uh, preliminary work that's being done at Stanford now. One big question is, what are we going to do with all this data that we've obtained from these portable devices that we're using to sample much more frequently than just during relatively infrequent office visits? For one thing, we're going to be able to understand what happens in a real environment, not an artificial office environment, and we're not going to need to interpolate or extrapolate between data points. One important consequence of this is that we're going to have to learn how to deal with this uh, data, so-called big data. It requires special handling, including massive storage needs and different analytical treatments. It needs to be displayed differently, typically with the use of graphics, not tables to be able to rapidly and intuitively understand trending. It's really a big idea, and it's a big advance, in my judgment, that will allow the extraction of new insights and value that cannot be done on a smaller scale. At its core, big data is about predictions, that is, the what, not necessarily the why. That's left to the scientists. It, remains, it, it renders outmoded certain assumptions about classic statistical methods because all the data is available, not representative samples. And finally, any criticism related to losses of accuracy at the micro level are more than balanced by the totality of data that allow for insights at the macro level. As one uh, analyst at Goldman Sachs mentioned in an influential research report just published a couple of months ago and widely read, Connected digital health offers the most commercially viable potential to, to the U.S. economy as it's currently orchestrated, particularly in terms of bending the cost curve. And I think I've shown you some examples of how that cost curve can be bent, at least in terms of equipment. They and other consultants, including those at McKinsey and elsewhere in Grandview, estimate that the U.S. mobile health market size is expected to grow more than sixfold between 2015 and 2020. In closing, I'd like to leave you with the proposition that digital health provides a compelling value proposition for all stakeholders in the healthcare system. This includes patients by their increased engagement in better care, patients through improved workflow and expanded reach to patients, payers by potentially reducing costs and improving outcomes, in pharma by receiving and better understanding of big data insights and value-based analysis. This is not to say that the road ahead will be free of challenges. We're still in the early stages of a proposed new care paradigm and implementation will require careful development and oversight based upon four cardinal principles. These are data validation, 
appropriate regulatory compliance, adequate protections for data privacy using HIPAA-compliant encryption, and finally, data integration into the patient electronic health records so that all of this information is all readily available to those that require it. Finally, the prediction and the proposition are both simple. The world is changing quickly due to demographics and technology innovation. The availability of connected mobile ophthalmic tools will enable tomorrow's physicians to provide more informed, cost-effective care with greater patient satisfaction anytime and anywhere. Thank you very much for your attention and the privilege of speaking with you today.